Francisco B in. I stopped by Children's Hospital to see Adam Stern, who was suffering from muscular dystrophy. I asked him if he uh, wanted me to get him anything. If there was anything he wanted that I might send him. And he said, uh, yes, he would like some mazes and some labyrinths to trace. A few months later, he was dead. A few years later, a student here at the university named Barbara Horsting proposed to erect a labyrinth on the campus and asked me to be her campus sponsor which I readily agreed to do. So we now have a labyrinth on the university campus that is for us a memorial to Adam Stern and also takes us back to Minoan culture and the birthplace of Western culture. The two central artifacts relating to the labyrinth in Minoan culture are the horns of consecration which you can see here over the doorway, and the two-headed axe. Okay, the move is made from Minoan Mycenaean culture through Homer to the pre-Socratic philosophers who try to investigate the processes of nature to find out what the first principles of the natural process are. Homer, through his similes, is more interested in expressing and showing how man is related to the processes of nature and is himself someone through whom these processes come to expression. This happens best of all in the Homeric similes. One of the best similes has to do with the return of Odysseus to Ithaca, where he is uh, singing songs disguised as a beggar to Penelope. And she melting at the sound with drops of tenderest grief her cheeks bedewed. Like the wind blowing across the tops of mountains, melting the snow into spring streams. So melted she. Him mourning as remote who sat beside her. The simile is a little more elaborate that, in, than that in terms of talking about the relationship between frozen mountain tops where the snow turns into uh, spring streams warmed by spring winds and Penelope's fate having waited for 30 years for the return of her husband, who has now come back to her. So that her fate is intertwined with the natural elements, and they mutually uh, give expression to one another in the portent of the coming spring. These similes of Homer finally develop in such a way, one's, one's perception of these similes finally develops in such a way that one can read uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey as a whole simile, as a, as a narrative that is built upon similitude such that an associative resonance develops across the whole texture of the text. This is what makes it an epic, namely something that takes place in the perfect tense where there's a past perfect, a present perfect, and a future perfect because of the accomplished action of the epic. The transition from Homer to the pre-Socratic philosophers is a transition from this perfect tense of the epic to an attempt on the part of the philosophers to arrive at concepts 
that give expression to the natural processes and their constitution by way of first principles. So that one moves from poetic lyricism that takes place in the ecstatic dimension of the perfect tense to an effort to arrive at uh, rational concepts. The pre-Socratics worked with the concepts of earth, air, fire, and water, which concepts are intact all the way up through Newton. So Thales says that the first principle is water. And then comes Anaximenes, who says it's air, and Anaximander, who says it's the apero, and it's the undifferentiated reservoir out of which all things are shaken, and then become individuated, and then have to pay the penalty according to the order of time for their individuation, according to some law of tragic necessity, such that they then have to return to make atonement to the reservoir. The pre-Socratics also develop a conceptual scheme that uh, tries to show how earth, air, fire, and water are related to various processes, such as the hot, the cold, the dry, and the moist, which is a higher conceptual abstract development than earth, air, fire, and water. These are known as the opposites, the way in which the hot can relate to the moist and the dry to the cold and so on. They can come into various combinations. The pre-Socratics also developed a notion of condensation and rarefaction, the way things evaporate and then uh, condense to come back down and rain, and they observe those processes. They also talk about attraction and repulsion, as in Empedocles, who discusses the concepts of love and strife. This all finally reaches a kind of climax with Anaxagoras and his notion of nous, which is the Greek word for reason. Anax Pythagoras said that uh, nous is the principle of all things, namely some structure of rationality. We then get to Socrates where there's a kind of inward turn. He becomes disenchanted with the pre-Socratic quest. He no longer wants to know what is the first principle of nature because he's so disturbed about himself and the extent to which he is prone to delusion about all matters of knowledge. So Socrates indicates that by the time he gets to Anaxagoras in his effort to understand the development of Greek philosophy, he realizes that nous is still some rational principle out there, whereas it's his m chief desire to know himself. So he makes the famous uh, Socratic confession of self-delusion. And this becomes a methodological principle in his effort to uh, achieve wisdom. So there's a kind of divide between the pre-Socratic philosophers who search after the first principles of nature and Socrates who is in pursuit of wisdom that will tell him who he is and that will relate to his confession of self-delusion. So what's important about the pre-Socratics is, on the one hand, they can be looked upon as the first scientists. But as such, they were still what we would today call vitalists. They believed that uh, everything was full of gods. All natural processes were expressions of uh, some vital principle that animates nature and makes the harmony between man and nature so powerful. This, this vitalism that uh, is characteristic of the early thinkers, scientists and philosophers, dropped out from Western thought to some extent by virtue of the triumph of the subject-object split in Descartes. And it's become a matter of uh, my chief uh, interest now to try to penetrate why vitalism, which relates to this sense of the harmony between man and nature, 
dropped out in the late 19th century as a result of the victory of the physicalistic orientation of the natural sciences ruled as they were by mathematics and physics. Biology fell into a terrible quandary where the dispute between physicalism and vitalism was discussed almost to the point of a warfare. The vitalists lost. What has prompted me to uh, take such an interest in this development is the garden that we have developed here at Santa Cruz under the direction of Alan Shadwick, who has related me by virtue of his own principles and procedures that he practices in the garden back to the sources of the vitalist tradition to be found in Goethe, the German poet, and his experiments in plant morphology. Goethe coined the word morphology and wrote a famous essay on the metamorphosis of plants. He was also skilled in the theory of color, which he wrote a long book about in order to uh, critically attack Newton's optics. And he also discovered the intermaxillary bone, so he made a big contribution to osteology. There's a strong scientific tradition that comes through Goethe's work. And it's fairly easy to characterize this tradition as vitalism, which was thrown out in the late 19th century by the hardening up of science in alliance with industry and technology. It's a remarkable development that uh, a garden based on the vitalist tradition going back to Goethe was initiated here at Santa Cruz, such that this whole historical development has been opened up again. Go ahead. Our garden was just uh, developed uh, at the beginning of the ecology movement, at least as, uh, uh, as, as it can be historically dated on April 22nd, 1970, Earth Day 1. Our garden had already been developed uh, for about a three-year period by Earth Day 1. And the garden has enabled uh, members of the university, particularly students, to become acquainted again with a vitalist tradition on the basis of their interest in ecology. It is the victory of the physicalistic sciences in alliance with industry and technology that in a kind of large, overgeneralized way can be said to have brought about our current ecological crisis. So that to uh, reaffirm the vitalist tradition in the reemergence of ecological awareness has become a major uh, effort here at Santa Cruz. There's a tradition in Western thought, uh, especially in terms of the early settlement of America, that made gardens the center of uh, all institutions of higher learning, which were initially seminaries, seed beds for people to uh, explore the meaning of the biblical tradition. So that our garden here is a return to that effort to nurture the life space of a university, which is really the meaning of the word ecology, namely the inhabitable household. And so the ecological movement is an effort to try to put our household in order because of the amount of disorder, the amount of, of bad seepage that has occurred over the last 50 years. Our motto for the garden is et in Arcadia ego, which is a phrase that was popular in Europe in the 19th century. It was the motto for Goethe's famous journey to Italy, where he went to find the original ultimate boar plant, a plant that, that would overcome the gap between essence and existence, a plant that would be the perfect specimen of the perfect tense, an epic plant. So our garden here is, uh, is an epic adventure in terms of trying to grow again into the dimension of the perfect tense. Ed in Arcadia Ego is a retrospective affirmation of the sweetness of life because it's based upon the perfect tense of accomplished action. 
It's an ecstatic uh, uh, projection into that uh, future mode where uh, the fear of death is overcome because your life is seen as a whole. Yesterday afternoon, we spent the afternoon with Huey P. Newton in Oakland. And I was amazed to appreciate the extent to which Huey P. Newton has this vision of the perfect tense. He spoke about how his vision of the future age of godliness is based upon the notion that God will be all in all. A notion that I found so strikingly similar to the uh, deepest vision of the Apostle Paul. If we're going to uh, take the word ecology seriously about putting our household in order, then we have to appreciate uh, the racial struggle of a revolutionary sort that is being carried on by people like Huey Newton. Huey gave us a poem that he has just written that will go into uh, a next book he's, he's written called Revolutionary Suicide. By having no family, I inherited the family of humanity. By having no possessions, I have possessed all. By rejecting the love of one, I received the love of all. By surrendering my life to the revolution, I found eternal life. Richard Baker Roshi of the Zen Center was with us when we went to visit Huey, and he remarked on how this was the Bodhisattva's vow. So again, if we're to put our household in order, we also need the Buddhist vision to tell us about our Dharma brotherhood with all sentient beings. Huey Newton himself spoke about how he wants to reverse the tyrannical dominance of man in order to return him to a loving restoration of kinship with all creatures. So that his poem can really be construed as the Bodhisattva's vow. We've now reached the top of the labyrinth and the heart of the labyrinth. In the Phaedo of Plato, which describes the last hours of Socrates' life, a life that has been delayed for a while because of a ship that has been sent to Crete in order to celebrate when the Athenian youths who were used to be sacrificed to the Minotaur in the heart of the labyrinth were spared because of the heroic uh, efforts of Theseus. The ship which is garlanded has returned to Athens and now it is time for Socrates to die. Socrates is the new Theseus who is able to liberate us from the Minotaur and the labyrinth of ourselves. That Minotaur being the figure of self-delusion which keeps us enslaved. So that this labyrinth at this university is a habitat for taking people through the maze of their lives such that they can eventually overcome the minotaur of self-delusion. The it's important for the ecology movement to appreciate the possibilities for allying itself with the revolutionary movement as represented by Huey Newton. Ecologists must become revolutionaries because they are called upon to be not only custodians of the sacred, but stewards of mysteries that relate to the vital processes of nature that now are in such jeopardy because of the ecological crisis. Therefore, we dedicate ourselves to the task of restoring the quality of life that we all so urgently look for. <laughs>